Now we're going to move to our second panel, which is going to explore the collaborative nature of medical and public health progress. I think the uh, Director Redfield set that up very nicely in his remarks earlier today. Uh, really, science, uh, we've got to have science, we've got to have scientific progress, we've got to put it in, into action through public health progress. Working together, we really can relegate very daunting health threats to the history books where they belong. So to talk to us about these topics, please welcome Dr. Richard Loomis, the Chief Informatics Officer of Clinical Solutions from Elsevier. Dr. Chris Austin, the Director of the National Center for Translational Science, or NCATS, at the NIH. Melinda Richter, Global Head of J Labs at Johnson & Johnson Innovation. Dr. Rick Wright, Director of Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, that's BARDA at the HHS. Uh, Gopal Khanna, the Director of the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, or ARC. And Lynn O'Connor Voss, President and CEO from the Mus Muscular Dystrophy Association. And our moderator, many of you know and have read often uh, the work of, of <coughs> Jeannie Bauman who, as you know, um, from her reporting, is with Bloomberg Law. Thank you all. Thanks. Sorry for my back. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Um, well, thanks for joining us. So we have a really great panel. I know the last um, panel had mentioned that it takes an average of 17 years to get <laughs> a new discovery um, into the hands of patients who need them, and I think um, partnerships and cr cutting across this sort of diverse ecosystem is um, a really important piece of cutting down that, that timeline. So, and we have a really great representation of this ecosystem sitting right here. So um, let's go ahead and jump right into it. Can we maybe just talk, um, go, down the, go down the panel and maybe and give a success story of a good partnership that you were involved in, um, you know, how that worked, and maybe sum, uh, summarize that a little bit. Um, whoever wants to start can go ahead. Sorry. Um, Go ahead. Yeah. So well, I'm uh, relatively new to the Muscular Dystrophy Association. Some of the partnerships that I can talk about were prior to MDA, but I'll, I'll focus on um, here uh, the opportunity, and as you said, um, the long timeline to get drugs to market is uh, rapidly changing in neuromuscular disease. And so one of the most exciting aspects of uh, MDA and neuromuscular medicine is we're discovering the genes that cause these diseases and drugs are coming to market. And the, the big opportunity we have right now is to really uh, establish a, a, a convening strategy to get everybody to join us um, as we bring drugs to market for the first time and try to get a system in place to actually implement and deliver those drugs. And we heard that this morning at the, in the opening remarks. So implementation is on our minds and we're calling this uh, initiative CARE 2025 because believe it or not, there are not enough doctors uh, that are trained in neuromuscular medicine. There are not enough skilled nurses. Uh, most of the care centers that we, we have care center, a care center network where we treat about 50,000 patients. Many of them are not in the position to administer all those drugs. Uh, access strategies need to be in place and those implementations to educate um, patients as well as clinicians. And so we are right now embarking on what I would say would be the largest public-private partnership to innovate care so all of those patients can get access to the right drug at the right time. Well, I'm glad you bring that up because that's been the mainstay for ARC, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. We are a science and research agency and our work, which is done by the research community, must go and touch the, uh, the lives of the patients at the point of care. So how we've been doing that is basically focusing on research but dissemination, implementation and use of the research and the products and tools that come out of ARC's work. <clears throat> so as I look back, um, and by the way, we are right now celebrating 20 years of ARC's um, it, uh, being put in place as an agency within the health and human services uh, as we know of today. And our work has always centered around the whole idea and notion of partnership. It's utterly important for us to partner 
not just with the research community but also with the systems, the physicians and clinicians because ultimately the work of, uh, of our research must get to the patients. At the end of the day, they are our customers. So bulk of our, actually a large part of our culture is centered around partnerships and, and uh, that's an area which I believe will become that much more in need as we move towards the digital health ecosystem where things move much faster uh, than they have in the past. So uh, I'm glad you bring up uh, the, the care component of it. That's what we are all about. And we need to make sure that our work gets to the patients at the point of care and improve lives, make it more safe, higher quality care, and create higher value for the system. Great, thank you. Thanks for inviting us to participate today as well. Um, it's a great question. Is taking too long to develop life-saving medicines and drugs and, and making them available for people? And I think a good example of success were those who envisioned back in 2005 and 2006 the passage of a bill called PAPA, the Pandemic All Hazards and Preparedness Act, which established a specific and intentional entity within government called BARDA whose goal and mission is to partner with the private industry so we can capture a lot of these technologies, a lot of the brilliant science that's been developed or, or discovered at the NIH and through all of the academic research centers around the globe. All of that's translated through different areas and departments. Some of that's come through small biotechs or pharmaceutical companies. And many of these life-saving drugs and medicines don't have a large marketplace. So we were experiencing this valley of death. So Congress passed PAPA in that the legislation to create this entity called BARDA to establish this public-private partnerships. Imagine a group within government whose role is to be like a pharmaceutical or biotech company with all of the expertise so we can partner to achieve success, reduce those timelines for the development and availability of drugs and vaccines and diagnostics and other critical life-saving tools. In 12 years, since the establishment of BARDA, we have formed over 250 public-private partnerships of all sizes <laughs> with industry, with um, partners, a small biotechs, large pharmaceutical international organization. In that 12-year time, we now have 48 different new drugs, vaccines, and diagnostics approved by the FDA. So they are available. Some of those are in the marketplace today, saving lives, improving health, and some of those are available in our strategic national stockpile for some of those really bad threats we face in our chemical and biological, nuclear and radiological threats or pandemic influenza come our way. We are better prepared. We have shown, and we have metrics we can share to show that this establishment of this organization, these unique public-private partnerships, has significantly reduced the amount of time for some of the these in their development stage and significantly reduced the cost of development through those. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you for having me here as well. Um, at Johnson & Johnson, we believe the best science and technology should become the best solutions for patients and consumers all over the world. And if we believe that to be true, we also have to be humble enough to say that the best science and technology is just as likely to come from outside the walls of a big company like J&J as inside. But when it's out there in innovation, in small entrepreneurial communities, it faces many more hurdles to becoming a viable commercial entity than can get to the people who need them. And so our job is to locally embed ourselves in ecosystems around the world with the express intent to catalyze and accelerate that innovation to the people who need them. And so at J&J, &J, we have formed Johnson & Johnson Innovation, and we have J Labs in 13 locations around the world. And at J Labs, our job is to first uh, provide educational programs and networking events and funding series to help those entrepreneurs get started. So that great research, as we heard this morning, shouldn't sit mm -hmm. on the shelf. It needs to move forward to have an impact. And then, as we get the most uh, high potential companies coming forward, 
we'll incubate them in our centers, and in our centers we'll usually have 30 to 50,000 square feet of space. Half of it is common research space filled with capital equipment that most companies would have to go out and raise millions of dollars to have access to. Um, and then they also get their own individual wet lab and dry lab and office spaces, and then a bunch of business and operational services so that the companies can focus on the science. And when we do that, we see success in spades. So around the world, we have over 600 companies now that have raised um, more than $16 billion worth of money in financing and strategic partnerships. Um, and more importantly than that, they're accelerating this research. So 25% of them are in clinical trials, 26% of them are already reached the market. And we focus on things that really matter and that innovation needs to serve every kind of person. Uh, and so that means our leadership in these companies needs to represent the people they serve. Um, so with that, 26% of our companies are women-led. That's compared to an industry average of 1%. And 25% of our companies are minority-led. That's compared to the industry average of 8%. Uh, so what we're trying to do is make sure that we service everyone with the most affordable and accessible care. Great. Um, so uh, NCATS, um, as an organization, has a mission to uh, innovate on um, every step of the translational process from target validation to public health um, and make those steps, those rate limiting steps, um, happen better, faster, cheaper. Uh, we always look for tenfold improvements in everything we do because that's the scope of the problem. Um, one of our principal tenets is that translation is obligatorily a team sport. Um, doesn't matter how smart you are, how many hours you work, uh, whether you have any work-life balance or not, <laughs> even if you don't, you still can't do this on your own. Uh, and as a result, uh, uh, every project NCATS does is a collaboration with somebody. Uh, our assumption is that uh, we and our collaborators and grantees know a lot, but uh, as Melinda just said, you know, whatever we know, most of it isn't at our place. So we have to take advantage of that to make as much headway as possible. Uh, but uh, collaboration, as we all know, uh, like all human relationships, uh, is easier said than done. And, uh, and we think one of the well, if one looks at the data, one of the reasons that translational projects fail uh, is uh, are, are collaborative models that, that don't work for one side or the other, and so break down and the project is collateral damage to, to, to that uh, relationship and patients suffer. So uh, we innovate on collaborative structures just as much as we innovate on you know, medicinal chemistry or clinical trial designs. Uh, and I'll just give you one example because you asked for a success story um, um, that, uh, that illustrates some of the principles that we look for, um, that we are big um, advocates of team science, but we're advocates of team science because we, we believe that, that, uh, that, that translation is only going to get done uh, much, much faster if we bring in unconventional partners and partners uh, whose expertise are by design complementary to each other. Uh, if, if you look at some of the way teams are put together, uh, the, their, their expertise is actually duplicative at times. And then that creates a competitive mm -hmm. a dynamic within the structure which, uh, which, which is actually counterproductive. Uh, mm -hmm. We also tend, particularly in the academic world, uh, we tend to be uh, uh, not so interested in, uh, in project management. Uh, or what I like to refer to as coaching. If you've got a team, you can't have it. It doesn't matter how talented your players are. If you don't have a coach to call the plays, uh, you're not going to score any touchdowns. So, so uh, we, we, we've had to work on, uh, on, on both uh, complementary expertise of the team players, but also uh, uh, creating a culture 
uh, where everybody knows that they're part of the team and everybody gets credit for being on the team. It's one of the big problems we have in, in academia is, uh, is the, the famous first last author problem in publications. Middle authors don't tend to get tenure. Um, uh, and, uh, and yet they are often absolutely essential uh, to these projects being uh, uh, succeeding. So we're working on all those things, but let me just give you an example. So th this was a, a project, um, uh, it was early, relatively early stage in the, uh, in the process. Uh, it has to do with a rare disease called uh, aromatic amino acid decarboxylase deficiency, or AADC for short. It's a, a neurological degenerative disorder which uh, kills children uh, pretty uh, uh, universally before the age of 10. And uh, there was a really great group of collaborators uh, or, or researchers at the National University of Taiwan who had taken upon themselves to develop an, adeno, an early AAV uh, uh, um, uh, vector uh, uh, delivery system um, directly into the brain of these children uh, that showed rather remarkable effects. Uh, but in that environment in Taiwan, they didn't have the, uh, the expertise or the resources to move this anywhere. So uh, an American company uh, became uh, aware of this, a little company called Agilis, which was in Boston, uh, licensed the technology. And they had some expertise in this space, but they didn't have all the expertise they needed and, and nor did they have the resources that they needed. Uh, so there were two pieces of the puzzle, but the, but the project was still dead in the water. So uh, they applied to one of the programs that we have, and uh, we realized that we had almost completely uh, collabor completely um, uh, complementary expertise among these three very different organizations. Uh, and and we, we built into this, uh, this structure of some learnings, and we actually did a little experiment within it. If we try to try the collaboration this way versus that way, does it work better um, uh, one way or the other? And I wouldn't be telling you the story unless it had a happy ending, of course, that, uh, uh, that the, uh, the FDA um, saw it clear to, uh, saw their way clear to, um, uh, to approve this um, um, uh, for a final testing in, in people after a relatively short period of time. And so what, what did we learn from this? We learned that there really is a lot of uh, uh, science, not necessarily sitting on the shelf, but sitting in people's brains in all over the world. Uh, and I know you do this, scouring the world. Um, and we have to be open to that. Uh, sometimes the NIH has not been as good as it could be, you know, looking uh, internationally, and we try to do that. Um, secondly, we try to be just the catalyst that, that, that is required to, to allow this project to then be on its own. So our job is not to own this. Our job is actually to work on it for as little time as possible until it can get out to the marketplace in this situation. Um, and what happened in this particular situation is the project was so successful um, that uh, then Agilis uh, got bought by a bigger company, PTC Therapeutics. And so this was a win for patients. It was a win for science. It was a win financially for the company. Uh, and it was a win for NCATS because we learned a lot and, and, and uh, met our public health mission. But we never would have done that. We never would have done any of those things if we had stayed with the old models of uh, it's all about me, I have to do everything mm -hmm. myself, uh, the, the traditional sort of principal investigator model. Um, so nice story. Well, and I think that's uh, just if I can for a minute, the, the work that we're doing is so important and so hard uh, and so complicated yeah. and so yeah, expensive exactly. that the only way that yeah. we can achieve success is if we come together yeah. in different kind of partnerships, whether it's big companies and small companies or, or uh, public-private yeah. partnerships like we're doing. Yeah. Um, it, that's the only way we're going to tackle some of these big, big problems and have an impact on people. Yeah, this, one of the things that I, one of the sayings that I like was said by a, a German pathologist in the last, 
can't say last century, it's two centuries ago now, uh, in the 1800s, uh, uh, that I can't say the German, but the, but the translation is, much is known, but unfortunately in different heads. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so that's why we're so big on having all these heads all mm -hmm. mashed together, mm -hmm. uh, because we find that what's, what's, mm -hmm. what's impossible to one person is trivial to another. And we, find, and we find that the more diverse the team, the more quickly that happens. And, uh, and it's, um, uh, but, but sometimes the systems we have in science mitigate against those behaviors, and that's, that's one of the things we need to all work on, yeah, I think, as leaders. I think a great transition, in fact, uh, Elsevier's motto is non solus, uh, uh, in Latin translated as not alone. And in fact, um, so our, our role in facilitating research is uh, historically has been as a publisher to, to disseminate uh, uh, research through our, our pu uh, books and journals. And in fact, uh, we publish about a quarter of the globe's academic and scientific literature. And while many, if not uh, most of the audience knows Elsevier as a publisher, um, certainly that uh, historically has been our past, we have transformed into an information and analytics company. So how do we leverage our, our underlying uh, literature and evidence-based content to deliver insights and help uh, inform better decision-making in science and, and in healthcare delivery. So within, uh, I'm uh, the chief informatics officer for Elsevier. Uh, we're focused, my part of the business is focused on healthcare delivery uh, and how do we help uh, doctors, nurses, and other allied health professionals make better decisions <coughs> as they're taking care of patients, leveraging this underlying evidence base, but, but delivering it at the point of care. Um, we've heard a, a common theme this morning is how challenging it is to, even when we know the right thing to do, how do we actually get uh, those on the front lines to, to, to help them uh, help ensure that they're, they're delivering the most appropriate care. Uh, we also have, throughout the course of our 140-year history, uh, a, a, a long a, a tradition of partnering uh, with many stakeholders across uh, multiple sectors, uh, academic uh, uh, medical centers and, and research institutions, uh, government organizations, uh, and so forth. And that is as true today as it uh, has, has um, ever been. In fact, uh, earlier this week, uh, we announced a partnership with and cats around uh, uh, to, to use their genetic and rare disease database to uh, facilitate us developing predictive models in uh, in rare disease to help uh, reduce uh, diagnostic error and uh, ultimately help identify those patients with rare disease that may have gone undiagnosed or or misdiagnosed. Uh, another example of of the strength of partnerships that, that we're uh, seeing right now is uh, around clinical trials and uh, our ability to uh, help uh, oncologists, in this case, identify uh, patients that are appropriate for clinical trials and, and match them uh, as, as part of a clinical workflow. Uh, so a little bit of context, uh, uh, Elsevier, uh, a couple of years ago, acquired a company via oncology. Uh, v Oncology is, uh, provides uh, uh, treatment selection guidance to oncologists as they're, they're treating patients, again, embedded in the clinical workflow and enabling them uh, is to help uh, or, or helping to enable them uh, to deliver precision oncology care, taking into account things like mm -hmm. uh, uh, stage, biomarkers, and so forth, uh, applying the current evidence base and then making recommendations about treatment selection. In addition to that, uh, we help identify patients that would be potential candidates for a clinical trial. So shortening uh, the time uh, to, to uh, accrue patients, helping patients get uh, uh, the, the experimental therapies that they might benefit from, and ultimately helping to, to accelerate science. Um, we have been very encouraged by uh, what we're seeing as a result of, of this capability, and so we wanted to work with our, our, some of our, our academic uh, uh, and, and oncology health system uh, partners to, uh, to better understand the impact that clinical decision support can have on accelerating uh, mm -hmm. and, and improving the efficiency of clinical trial matching. And in fact, uh, early data suggests in our, our uh, multi-site study 
that we're facilitating that, that we're actually seeing uh, a two to three X uh, increase in clinical trial recruiting rates across some of the largest cancer centers in the US. So we're, we're very encouraged by, by what we're seeing um, and, and look to, to expand this work in the future. But as has been mentioned by several of the panelists earlier, um, it, it's not just us and it's not just our oncology system partners, but as we look to uh, further expand our capabilities in clinical trial recruiting to, to help solve this, this uh, significant industry challenge, um, we're looking for partners. We're actively looking for partners uh, in the pharmaceutical industry, for example. We're actively seeking partnerships from, uh, uh, from the public sector as well, um, because we believe that we will be able to do this faster. Uh, we will be able to do it uh, better um, with, with the help of others. It's, it's not all in our heads. It's, it's working together where we'll, we'll actually achieve this. That's great, especially given how much promise there is in many fields, but especially cancer and the low recruitment rate. I think it's around 5%, so it's, it's a lot of challenges to solve. So I, we've just heard some great examples about how um, partnerships can, can really help um, accelerate medical progress, but do you see any potential pitfalls in having different sectors of the ecosystem work together to tackle health challenges? Um, if, no, but actually, <coughs> I see huge possibilities. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that we have realized is that uh, we've got to think non-traditional partners and reach out to the real consumers of research work. And that's what ARC's aim is, to make sure that the delivery of services is high quality, safe, and high value. And while at the end of the day, our customer is the patient, but we cannot forget the consumer of research is the delivery system. So what we are doing at ARC now is saying, hmm, we need to invite delivery systems leaders to come and tell us what are their pain points, mm -hmm. what are the challenges, and also try and understand their unmet needs so that we can go out and reach out to the research community and say, here are the problems that need to be solved. Now, one of the things we talk about is patient engagement. So what we've done is we've said, hmm, let's put out there some challenges where private sector and innovators can participate with us. So we, we've launched three challenges for the first time ever in ARC's history. The first one is focused on developing an app for patient reported outcomes data. How do the patients feel about their coverage that they have received before that information is filtered by the clinician? And it adds to their paradigm and helps them think 360 degree about the person as opposed to them as a patient. And that's a huge paradigm shift. And we are able to move in that direction because the private sector, the innovator community, that has not been involved in the past. So it goes back to identifying the non-traditional partners. The other thing we realized is that we need to do roundtable discussions with the system's leaders because they have to consume the research and make sure it's supplied and usable at the point of care. So that voice has uh, helped us rethink mm -hmm. how we do our work. And that will, I believe, will make research much faster because delivery systems executives are saying we need operational research. So while foundational investigator initiated research will always be there, but there's also need for research to be faster it, uh, it needs to be more applied. It needs to be more transdisciplinary in nature, which means we have to engage not just uh, uh, medical experts and researchers, but also social scientists mm -hmm. um, engage in the research mm -hmm. uh, initiatives that we launch, the uh, informatics folks mm -hmm. who bring in data and science as well. So I, I agree with you that we have to take a non-traditional approach to partnership as well as we are envisioning uh, going into the future. Mm -hmm. Well, if I could build on that. So when you're <coughs> establishing a partnership, it's because usually uh, you're good at different things. And what does that mean? So, you know, small companies are better at coming up with orthogonal new revolutionary ideas and trying them out. And bigger companies are better at the development, manufacturing, distribution piece, right? So we're both good at different things. Uh, the pitfall is not understanding each other well enough because you're very different. You live in very different worlds. So because of what big companies are good at, you know, we may 
be slower at doing some things, whereas the little companies, I mean, they live on a burning platform where every day costs them money, and if they don't get it done in a certain time, they may not be mm -hmm. there anymore. So the pitfall may be not understanding each other well enough, taking the time to understand each other, mm -hmm. and having the patience to have a long-term perspective. You know, this is, this is a world where it takes 17 years mm -hmm. to get a drug to market, so we can't expect things to happen overnight. Um, and so for us, every ecosystem we go into, we partner mm -hmm. with somebody in that ecosystem to bring that JLabs to that ecosystem. We want our JLabs to be their JLabs. So we'll partner with universities or governments or clinical organizations. Um, and so our job is to get to know each other, figure out what we each do well, have our mission forefront. Why are we here? Why are we doing this? And stay the course, because the work is hard and it takes a long time. And I'll add on to what Melinda is saying. It's exactly right. You talk about small company and large companies trying to interact and, and figure out their cultures, and I'm going to insert government into that culture, and there's a whole different culture of government from any industry or any private sector partner out there. So when we talk about trying to find unique partnerships that are going to be successful in bringing together disparate groups and cultures, we have to give those teams time to understand each other's language and, and, and collide, actually, these cultures, different levels. And imagine, well, I've seen the outcomes when you bring together even disparate um, technical entities, engineers and biologists working together to reduce the footprint of a diagnostic for a home diagnostic test that can tell you three days before you're infected you have an infectious disease and can lead to earlier drug treatment and appropriate actions to reduce the spread of an influenza virus or other spreading <coughs> infectious diseases. Bringing together the languages and allowing them the time and the space to, to learn each other's language is, is really critical, but it's at this collision of cultures Mm -hmm. with the commitment of that partnership where invention sparks, mm -hmm. where new ideas arise. Because if we just spend a lot of time mm -hmm. talking to ourselves and those who we know and know best, we come up with the same things over and over again. <laughs> Maybe small incremental changes. But when you collide cultures and bring in the best of each of those with open-minded people with different perspectives on a solution, that's where we find those answers and we can accelerate the discovery and development of these solutions. If I could just build on that from the um, advocacy organization mm -hmm. perspective, um, you know, again, I mentioned this is kind of a never before moment for our patient population because drugs are coming to market, we're doing genetic discovery. Um, we're very entrepreneurial. The tradition has not been entrepreneurial, but I'm an entrepreneurial person because I came from the for-profit world. The challenge um, is to kind of reposition the role of an advocacy organization in the minds of a commercial player, of the academics, because you know we're doing some major initiatives that are very unusual, I guess, in some respects, but we have some partners out there like MMRF and other organizations that are doing things like us. So we started a, a very large uh, data hub with a partnership with IQVIA. The, the idea is, you know, how do we find patients faster? How do we ready all these clinics for clinical trials? Um, how do we get some real-world evidence assembled so we know more about the, the natural history of these diseases so we can accelerate cures? And um, it's been a very interesting learning experience. A, understanding your own DNA or the trend, or I should say as our DNA is evolving, uh, repositioning that to our players out there. Um, I would say also, you know, on this consortium that I'm involved with, with several registries uh, with uh, mostly cancer um, associations, um, we don't spend enough time talking to the end user about the data. Uh, what do they really want? What do they really need? How are we going to put that together? You know, it's not just about getting started. We really need to, we all need to kind of take a step back, and I think this is kind of what the panel's alluding to. You know, what are people's motivations and barriers? What do they need? Are we designing something that's truly relevant? I mean, that's to me one of the most frustrating things that I've been dealing with lately, that you think you're doing exactly what everybody needs, but maybe not. Maybe we didn't do enough of the uh, measurement first. So um, I think the exciting uh, thing about running a nonprofit or being in the nonprofit world right now is we really are at the center of the ecosystem um, in health. We have, in our case, uh, more research than anyone else has done in the industry, more clinicians, more experts, all the patients. And we're trying to figure out how to kind of leverage that to uh, accelerate what's really needed in the patient population. 
And um, part of that is um, really meeting with all the stakeholders and figuring out um, um, where they size us up and where we fit in. We don't fit in just in the advocacy department of pharmaceutical companies. We really are in research, et cetera. So um, that's kind of a, a long story to say that it's about, I think, more insights first before you get started. Um, to, to add, uh, I, I couldn't agree more on the importance of, of getting close to, to the ultimately either the end user and, and to the mm -hmm. patient. Mm -hmm. And, and from, from our experience at Elsevier uh, and, and my personal experience in the past, it's often necessary to form partnerships to be able to do that because ultimately um, uh, the, that, the, the person that's closest to the patient, um, uh, the, the way to get to them and the way to, to ensure that you're solving the right problems and in the mm -hmm. right ways is, is through partnership with, uh, in, in that case, often with provider organizations or with advocacy, advocacy organizations uh, and so forth. Um, uh, another um, uh, uh, thought is uh, around, we often hear and, and Chris emphasized this earlier, um, the learnings through partnership. And it's not just about mm -hmm. the learnings about what the, the objectives of the partnership are aiming to achieve, but also the learnings about how to effectively work together. And, and we often hear uh, about the, the, when partnerships are formed, uh, in a big splash mm -hmm. around when the partnerships are formed, and we often hear about the, the outcomes of successful partnerships. But we don't hear so much about why did partnerships fail? And many of them do, many of them, them don't work out, but why did they fail? What were those learnings? And even when they're successful, we don't necessarily understand uh, or, or, or uh, uh, publicize the reasons for, for why, uh, mm -hmm. why partnerships might be yeah. successful. So I think there's a role in the broader uh, uh, research community in the context of partnerships to, to focus and to emphasize um, the, the learnings, not just about uh, from, from the objectives of the partnership, but also mm -hmm. um, how to effectively partner. Just to build on that, I think uh, it's an interesting concept to think that you would start and kind of create a predictive model as to whether this team can be successful. So you know that up front, mm -hmm. what, are the, what are the potential pitfalls and very few, you know, you might, you get so enamored with the project and with the goal and what you're trying to accomplish that I don't think any, any of organizations really factor in that importance of the people and who's on the team. And at a bio conference recently, I was on a panel, and someone I think was from NIH said we should have something called the Jerko meter, which sounds ridiculous. <laughs> but you know, you kind of need to know who's on your team. You know, are they on your team? Are they going to play well? And that's a whole psychology piece that I don't think we factor into collaborations that much. I'm curious to hear more about this coach idea, because that's a fascinating idea to have a coach as part of the collaborative team to really drive that yeah. HR piece. And, that, that yeah, and, I, and, I, and I think that the, um, the perhaps some three, it was just three examples come to mind real quickly from, from our failures, because mm -hmm. uh, we always we don't like to talk about our failures, but, it, but we learn the most from them. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and, and I would say, I'm not sure there are failures if we learn something. You know, the, the, the only true failure is if you didn't learn anything. Uh, and, I, and, and I just share these as an example of, um, of, of roadblocks that we've run into. And fundamentally what they come down to is though everybody's interested in the end outcome being better health for patients. Uh, realistically, most players in the system are not rewarded for that. They're rewarded for some intermediate outcome. So their incentives are to the intermediate outcome, not to the ultimate outcome. And when those things collide, the intermediate outcome wins. So let me, let me, tell, you what I'm, let me tell you what I'm talking about here. There's just three quick examples. Uh, a, a very well-known academic center uh, that we uh, uh, support fantastic people, fantastic trainee who had this project to reduce recidivism in the ER uh, from STDs. And it worked great and, uh, and it was really exciting results. So of course I asked her, so then what happened? And she said, what do you mean what happened? I just told you what happened. And I said, well, well but you're in an academic <laughs> medical center. Didn't you, didn't you put this into practice in the ER? And she, she said, no. So I turned to the guy who was the head of the health system, who was also in the room, and I said, well, why didn't you do that? You have the research over here, you have the practice over here. And they looked at each other as if to say, were we supposed to do that? 
And I, and I, I was just, I was just astounded. And here we have two really fantastic, smart people, who, who have these, these, these this, have this mismatch within their own institution. So I asked this, uh, the, the person who had done the work. So why, 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 why didn't you do this? He said, Well, you know, my, my job is, uh, as a fellow, is to do a study, complete my fellowship, publish a paper, and get a job. I have done all those four things. Get off my back. What do you want me to do? <laughs> and it was right. She was right. And I realized, oh my gosh, you know, we got so, we got a problem. S second one is in a drug development project um, when we were working with a small company who um, we, we didn't realize this until push came to shove, uh, who had uh, having to be a bioprocess problem, uh, and 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 we realized that the uh, the, the scale up technology that they had or scale up for the compound would just never work, uh, and uh, and and the reaction was we know. We said, what do you mean you know? And you haven't fixed it? And they said, no, no, no. We have promised our investors to get it to this point and then get somebody to buy it. Right? The greater fool theory. I just have to somebody who won't know bioprocess well enough to know that this is impossible, but, but we would have made our money. And that's our purpose, as you know, that would serve our investors. And, he, and from his point of view, he was absolutely correct. He would have met his milestones just like the trainee did to meet hers. And, and the third example is, uh, and these are all well-meaning people, you know, for the most part. They're just trying to do what their, what their objectives say. And, and the third is probably the most heart-wrenching, uh, which is with patients. So, so we think one of the most um, uh, important disruptive technologies uh, for improving this process uh, is involvement of the people who are supposed to benefit from what we do on the research team at the very beginning which seems to us kind of obvious, but, but, but we've just never done that. But what we learned was if we do that without training people who we put on the research team, that is not fair to anybody, including the patients, right? So we'd never put a scientist on a research team without making him go get a PhD or an MD and all this training and stuff. And then we take a patient who has no knowledge of this process, put them on a research team and expect them to understand the language everybody's saying, and that can result to prof in profound misunderstandings and really uh, hard feelings. Uh, and and the, I would say the most difficult situations we've been in are when, interestingly, when a project is successful. So that uh, early on in a project, the, the patients and the researchers and the doctors are all on the same page. But as a therapeutic comes into uh, view, the the parent, uh, not always, but 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 uh, the parents and the researchers and the regulators and the interests can diverge. So our our responsibility is to all people with a disease, present and future. And, but the responsibility of the parent is to their child only. Full stop. Now, they may be interested in other children, too, eventually. But when those two diverge, the, it's a pretty d dramatic uh, 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 shift. And often, the patients feel that they need to peel off from the research process uh, and use the knowledge that they have from the research team to advantage their own child and their mm -hmm. own treatment. And I think we understand, we, as parents, uh, and a lot of us are parents, we understand that. I, 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 I think that I wouldn't begrudge that from any parent, but we have to be realistic with ourselves that this will happen. It happens, especially if a project is successful. Uh, so, so just three examples where we're, we've learned from that, and so what we do are different each, each time, uh, but, but we also uh, do what, what uh, our Elsevier colleague said was just we publish it, of course, <laughs> because because we do we, we do think just as you do, we have to share these learnings and the failures as much as the successes so that so that other people uh, can learn from the, the pain often that we've been through. So how do we realign incentives so that they get from that middle outcome to that ultimate outcome? So I think it's about having uh, 
an aligned vision of what we're trying to do, which is around the patients mm -hmm. um, or the people we're trying to keep healthy and not get sick in the first place. Uh, and I think when you do that, then you overcome these things. And if you constantly put it at the center, then you overcome all the challenges. Uh, so for us, for example, we recently did a collaboration uh, with Children's Hospital here in Washington, D.C. We're bringing a J Labs here to Washington, D.C. We're going to uh, regentrify the old Walter Reed Medical Center um, and uh, on this campus we're going to have a number of different research groups, uh, genomics labs, device labs, uh, in addition to a J labs there and we're going to have an auditorium where we can have think tanks and, and policy discussions and, and all, all of this came together in a very uh, amazing way because we were all concerned about putting a brighter light and bringing a bigger microphone to a very big underserved patient population being our babies and our children. Um, there are not enough innovations for those, uh, for those little people. And so, you know, we, we went through a lot of challenges, but when you keep your goal in mind of who you're serving, it's amazing what you can overcome together. And as you go around and talk to people, like I happened to talk to Rick, that we were going to be doing this here in DC. And he said, well, let's do something there together too. And so together, uh, BARDA and uh, J Labs have formed a medical countermeasure innovation unit where we're going to focus on uh, attracting and accelerating innovations to guard against 21st century health security threats, biological, radiological, nuclear, chemical attacks, pandemics, epidemics. And all of this is going to happen at this one campus because we're all very mission focused on what we're trying to do and who we're trying to serve. And, and listen, uh, forming a relationship with a government partner is challenging. <laughs> uh, Come on, <laughs> tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> but we did it in a record amount of time. Absolutely. And everybody, including all of our lawyers, were mission focused on why we were trying to do this and that helped us overcome all of the obstacles. So keeping the, the vision, the mission at the core of everything we do is what helps you get through all of these challenges and do the right thing when it matters. I'm glad you talk about the vision part of it. Coming from the private sector, by the way, I've spent one third of my career in industry, one third in government, having served two presidents and two governors, and one third in startup ventures technology world. So I, I came here and talked about uh, at ARC about the mission, but before we can get to the mission or rethinking our mission, it's important to recognize three things. One, what are the disruptors? What are the changes that are happening that require us to rethink our own vision and mission? Uh, the second piece is taking a stock of what you're good at. What are your core competencies? Mm -hmm. and, and the third piece is uh, finding the real big problems that need to be solved. So what we're doing at ARC um, is saying, okay, uh, what are the disruptors? There are six of them. We know that uh, mergers and acquisitions, uh, digitization of everything, internet of things, um, data flowing through the system, uh, new uh, entrants coming into the marketplace, they're all targeting only one thing. How care will be delivered to the Americans over the next five to 10 years? So when you look at it, you've got by, by the way, show of hands, how many have, of you have been to a clinician or a physician in the last 12 months? And keep your hands up, please. How many of you know of a family member, friend, or somebody who's seen a clinician over the last 12 months? There you go. So 275 million Americans each year go through the care continuum from prevention to palliative care. Guess what? $2.5 trillion is spent in this delivery of care. And that's a huge paradigm shift for us. So we are saying at ARC, okay, what are we really doing? So if you look at four quadrants within the health and human services, on the right side you'll see NIH, science and research for cure. You'll see FDA focusing on science and research for drug safety and efficacy. And over here, you'll see science and research for public health, the CDC model. But right here is ARC, science and research for care. I submit to you that as we are taking this conversation, 
see it from the context that cure and care mm -hmm. are two sides of the same coin. Yep. And that's a paradigm shift that we need to make to make the de delivery of care more efficient, high quality and high value. Yep. And as we do that, we need to say, what are our core competencies? So at ARC, we said, we really are at good th three things. Number one, science and research, systems research. Mm -hmm. Second is, we are extremely good at bringing those products and solutions for practice improvement. And the third one is data and analytics. Mm -hmm. So when we're looking at these three core competencies, we're saying, oh my God, we can have a substantial exponential impact in improving the delivery of care. Mm -hmm. And so coming back to what you're saying is when you're looking at your mission or a vision, it has to be defined in a different context, particularly us for us in government, because we get sometimes um, it, within our cocoons and we see the world very limited, but we've got mm -hmm. to see it you know, in a much larger frame to be efficient and to be effective. So I just wanted to introduce the idea that when you're looking at the mission, we've got to rethink uh, how we do our work. And I think an important part of that in this conversation is you have to have the champions and buy-in at every level. Mm -hmm. It can't just be the, the scientists in the lab or it can't be the program manager on the project in the company or in the government. It can't just be the lawyers. It can't just be, it has to be from the top down. You have the support for these projects, mm -hmm. from the leadership of both entities are all partners. I have um, been involved in many projects in Barter with our industry partners and I find sometimes two or three years into it that is a, a lower level management project. And I don't have the complete buy-in from the, the CEO or the senior leadership of that company. Therefore, you can imagine where that project mm -hmm. falls in prioritization within that company if the senior management sometimes aren't even aware that we have this project going on. and so. It's critical, and we've changed our way of biz doing business with industry this way, that we have complete buy-in from the CEO of every company, large or small, all the way down through the, the senior management, through the project teams, the lawyers are on mm -hmm. board. That's how things happen quickly. Mm -hmm. If someone on either side have to take the time to try to educate someone in their chain of command or hierarchy or other different project groups or, or decision-making structure, then you've lost valuable time. But mm -hmm. if the senior leadership, they don't need to know the details of a project so much as they need to know who their partners are and why you're partnering and what is that joint mission of that partnership and what we're going to do together and how we're synergizing to make something available faster or less expensively and more efficiently in some way. If they have no idea that they have this partnership out there, those partnerships stale or stall and then mm -hmm. eventually fade away. Yep. So speaking of valuable time, we are actually out of time. I have uh, <laughs> so many more questions, but um, we uh, need to open it up to the, uh, Q for a Q&A, if anyone has some. I think um, there's a mic coming around, right? So um, if you could actually uh, you know, introduce yourself before you ask your question, that would be great. So. Uh, my name is Herbert Partis. I'm from professor from Cornell in Columbia, New York, Presbyterian. Uh, this is a great panel. I, I want to raise one additional question. I think that many uh, research areas are finding an overlap between what has ordinarily been sequestered uh, illnesses and other illnesses. So one finds out something about autism and all of a sudden finds there's something related in mm -hmm. schizophrenia. When the same ALS, dementia. Uh, to what extent, I mean, the scientists themselves will try to make those bridges, but to what extent there should there be more, any more effort to link up entities in which the science is starting to converge, although coming from different directions? Mm -hmm. <coughs> I can just speak from uh, Muscular Dystrophy Association. Um, one of the challenges and opportunities we have is we're the only umbrella organization. So we have 43 diseases under the hood not just one, ALS, there's, um, and, and we're hoping through this merger really of research and care, uh, all driving to cure, even the, res all the, that the, there'll be more collaboration and more discovery hopping from one disease to another. And so that's, that's, you know, our research team is really working on that, our committees are working on that. That is a huge um, opportunity and value proposition. Um, I can't speak for the academic world, but I think in our world, because we see all this, 
all these grant applications come our way. Our venture philanthropy group, our venture group also funds the Valley of Death and biotech companies. And so we can connect the dots, at least that's our hope. But I do think that's a massive opportunity, a missed opportunity out there, the siloed research approach. And uh, I'm glad you asked that question because uh, one of the priorities I've set up for our agency is to focus on multiple chronic conditions. One out of four Americans are living with multiple chronic conditions. 80% uh, of spend for care is after age 80. And it's a huge drain. Not only is the quality going down of life as one lives with mil multiple chronic conditions, but the cost is going up. While our goal is to reverse the pyramid upside down and then say the cost should go down and quality should improve. <coughs> so if we can have a common cause, all of us, I think we can do exactly what your vision is. So if we look at multiple chronic conditions and if it impacts so many Americans, why can't we make that? Because that will bring all sorts of research together. It will bring all solutions together, but for a common cause. And that's why I believe time has come when we need to take a step back and say, what we need is 21st century care, which is targeted on some common big problems that we must solve. So it's not just about research, it, but it's about solving a much bigger problem and bringing other players all together. So I'm glad you asked that question. You know, at, at Johnson & Johnson, we have this um, uh, uh, global external innovation organization, which is Johnson & Johnson Innovation. And uh, it represents our three sectors. We have our pharmaceutical sector, our device sector, and our consumer health sector. <coughs> and what we find intriguing is what goes across everything. Mm -hmm. And when we look at um, innovations for uh, potential to uh, reside at J-Labs, for example, we have a cross-sector team that looks mm -hmm. at it. So it comes from every therapeutic area, every uh, device sector, orthopedic surgery, consumer health. And as we look at that innovation, we don't look at it for what it is today, but for the potential of what it could be and where it could have the most impact, whether there are bigger uh, patient populations or if it could actually, with a little bit of tweaking, actually be more powerful in a certain area. Um, and, and it's a very unusual group to do that, to have that kind of a crosstalk. And certainly we do that even as we partner with organizations like BARDA. We did a quick fire challenge for a new kind of respiratory mask. It hadn't been evolved since, what, 1940? Something like that? 1850s when they Oh, 1850s. <laughs> okay. A little bit, a little bit before change. that. Time to change. And as we looked at it, we looked at these innovations for how they could also be uh, prevention opportunities for lung cancer. Uh, so I think we have to think orthogonally like that. That's the only way we're going to really mm -hmm. revolutionize yeah. the system. Mm -hmm. we, we've heard a number of times this morning uh, around the impact that, that 21st century cures uh, uh, has mm -hmm. the potential to have in the future. One aspect of cures is, uh, is promoting the free flow of, of data um, for, for many purposes to improve the quality of care delivery, but also to, to facilitate research. And I think um, the, the opportunity to create partnerships to exchange data, to uncover linkages between different, seemingly different diseases mm -hmm. is, is essential. And my hope is that as, as uh, data liquidity increases, in part because of, of 21st century cures and, and the underlying uh, technology, health IT infrastructure that we now have in place, hopefully that will become easier to, mm -hmm. to, to gain those insights. I actually want to, since you brought up 21st century cures, I mean, that's changed everything. That's had such a dramatic impact. It's allowed me and empowered me within BARDA to change our entire way of doing business with government, to empower us to, to rethink how challenging it can be to engage with government because we have so many ideas, so many inventions, so, many, so much research, so many entrepreneurs out there who are not traditional government partners. Mm -hmm. It empowered us to stand up an entire division, restructure BARDA in some way, to have a new division of research, innovation, and ventures. They empowered us to stand up a venture capital fund mm -hmm. for government mm -hmm. to invest in with an independent third party entity to bring additional innovation how we 
fund research and science, but also how we think across the mm -hmm. ecosystem of innovation to bring that those those ideas in government <coughs> much faster. Instead of waiting for research to, to come right. through a bureaucratic process of, of understanding what's in Fed mm -hmm. Biz Ops or what's on some website happening in the Beltway of Washington, DC, it's allowed us now to stand up incubators and accelerators across the entire country to capture ideas and innovations coming out mm -hmm. of academia and, and industry and, and small companies, entrepreneurs that are one to three or five people in a garage, that is the spark that we know changed the technology industry mm -hmm. in our lives that we have today. Harnessing that approach for biomedical sciences and, and, and improving our health care today is what allowed us then to, to partner with, with J Labs and others, but to open the garage doors across America and across the world to find the innovations that are going to make our lives easier and healthier and such. And, mm -hmm. you know, our partnering with J Labs is one of the most exciting and most innovative things I think we've ever done. And I, I look at J Labs, if you haven't been into one of those, as this culture of innovation, but when I talk about opening the garage doors, across the world. I mean, J-Labs is to me is like the multi-layered, the world's largest garage out there of innovation and ideas. Now that BARDA can tap into those, actually you can now apply for funding in BARDA through our, our drive program and get a response in less than 30 days instead of nine to the 14 months. Mm -hmm. You can actually reach out and talk to us for various programs now without having to pay tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars for a marketing consultant to introduce you to someone in BARDA. You can actually submit a proposal to BARDA in 2,000 word abstract without paying someone $100,000 up to a million dollars to write a proposal to BARDA. So changing the way government does business, empowered by 21st Century Cures, not only to find innovative science and technology, but be innovative in government and innovative in innovation itself so we can improve our partnerships. A tremendous, powerful act that's changed everything. I'm glad you said that because now imagine for a moment, <laughs> we've got 21st Century Cures. And that was brilliant because that has helped bring improvement in uh, cures. Can you imagine if you couple that with 21st century care? Mm -hmm. We live in the digital age. We've got to rethink how we do research, how we bring our uh, products, uh, end results of research, tools, etc., for improving care because it has to be much faster. It has to be higher quality. It has to be safe and must create higher value. But Cures alone uh, cannot do it. It has to be coupled with care. Mm -hmm. So I would love to hear from the audience as to what do you think about the whole notion and idea of 21st century cares? That is, I think, a great point and also a great point. Unfortunately, we have to wrap up and we have to end, but I think that that is a great question to to, um, and a great thought to think about as we go to lunch. I'm not going to stand in the way of your lunch. So um, thank, thank you to you. our thank panelists you. for joining us. Thank you.